That would be practical. <laughs> that would be better. Yeah. Printed, I think. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. But it's recycled. <laughs> recycled paper. So. Okay, at least made in China. Yeah. Oh, a little sticker. Yeah. Uh, so good morning, everybody. It's great to have this group around the table. We'll do intros in just a second. Uh, my name is Michael Harrington. I'm a commissioner for the department. Some of you I know, some of you haven't met yet. So it'll be great to get a little understanding of who's around the table and what experience you have and your interest here. Um, I think as Jay just pointed out, we're recording the meeting to ensure we're complying with uh, open meeting law, which just went through an update to the open meeting law. So um, <clears throat> there's a difference between advisory bodies or decision making bodies. I think we're we probably ride that line. Um, it's an advisory board, but um, I think it just comes down to whether or not we're making decisions that have impacts on laws, policies, um, and or funding uh, and uh, or are we simply making recommendations for someone else to make those decisions right and um, for instance the, the main difference between the two public bodies is if you're an advisory uh, board uh, you don't need to record the meeting but if you are a public uh, body you do have to uh, that makes decisions you have to record the meeting as well so we'll just be safe we'll record it that way we can also uh, publicize it or put it on our web, uh, make, uh, make it accessible for others. We also have all of our uh, credentials for logging in if any member of the public either wants to come here or uh, be a part of the meeting online as, as we go forward. Um, before we do intros, though, I just want to do a quick rundown, just again, maybe for the record and for all of us, but um, there used to be the Apprenticeship Council. Um, one or two of you may be familiar with the Apprenticeship Council. Um, the, the section governing uh, apprenticeships was rewritten about a year and a half, two years ago. Um, took effect, I think this, is it this, just this past July or was it the previous July? I don't know. Um, but anyway, so under the new rewrite, it created this advisory board, which is just really a, a reconstitution of the council, but updated um, to meet what the U.S. Department of Labor um, and the apprenticeship, uh, the National Apprenticeship Group have put in place as best practices. So Jay and, and some others uh, really rewrote the statute from scratch, uh, which brought this group together. Uh, so we're excited to see the work that comes out of here to make uh, Vermont's apprenticeships more competitive, um, more desirable, uh, more pervasive around the state and more accessible um, for folks. Um, and so I know they've been doing a lot of work on that. Just for the for the record, the way the board is made up, um, the commissioner of labor designee serves as the chair, uh, the director, uh, which in this case is talking about the apprenticeship director, the state apprenticeship director, which is Sarah, shall serve as the secretary, the secretary of education or a designee, the member, uh, a member of the state workforce development board, uh, two representatives of a recognized union organization re uh, representing occupations with apprenticeship programs, two representatives of employer program sponsors, so uh, employers that have a a sponsored apprenticeship program, one representative from related instruction or training from an adult or secondary career technical technical education uh, program, and two representatives from underserved communities, um, all appointed by the governor. Uh, and so that brings all of us together, those of us online and around the table. Um, so why don't we just start off with, with introductions? Um, and if you could not only share you know, who you are, what you represent, what organization you belong to, um, maybe your experience with apprenticeships um, and how they are directly tied to the yeah, so good morning, everyone. So again, my name is Sarah Knight. I am fairly new here with the state, but um, I've got my six months mark in this role um, as according to Act 55, it's the state apprenticeship director. Um, I guess is the official title. Uh, but my background, I actually come from career and technical education where I worked for the past 25 years 
um, 12 or so, those last 12 as a work-based learning coordinator. So that was really my uh, introduction to apprenticeship and, and really where my passion came from because I was working with young people on their career pathways and apprenticeship was um, a really uh, great option and I saw so much success from students, especially in electrical and plumbing. Uh, so now kind of I'm working on the other side of it, getting to work with businesses and organizations to, to spread and grow and modernize the programs. Just excited to be here. Um, I'm Ronnie Bastin. I'm the director at Vermont Works for Women. And I've been there five years, but for many more years than that, Vermont Works for Women has been running pre-apprenticeship training programs, specifically towards women or gender expansive individuals. Um, we really work on trades focus, but expanding those beyond. And then we, a couple years ago, started a high school pre-apprenticeship program. Um, currently it's at Essex CTE, but hoping to expand as well. How's it going, everybody? I'm Derek Williams. I'm the Assistant Director of Adult and Tech Ed at the River Valley Tech Center. Uh, this is my 10th year in that role, and I did six years as an ag teacher uh, before that. Um, most of my experience uh, is through a co-op coordinator, and it's mostly uh, plumbing and electrical is where we're sending the majority of our students. Hi, everyone. My name is Rowan Hawthorne. I am principal assistant to the commissioner at the commissioner's office here at Labor. I've been for a little over a year now. Listen and support. Uh, I'm Cindy Robillard. I am an assistant director in our workforce development division. I have over 30 years with the Department of Labor and working with lots of different programs, um, all of our federal training programs. Apprenticeship is actually new to me. So um, when I came into this role, uh, Jay mentored and kind of guided me through the process. I've had conversations with several of you and then now supporting Sarah in her role. I think we're just, um, you know, looking to learn as much as we can, uh, tap into, we, we spend a lot of time uh, tapping into resources from our counterparts in other states um, and just really bringing our internal capacity up to speed. Um, we didn't mention, but Sarah also um, has two, has just hired her second um, program support technician, which is a apprenticeship support person. So we're now really what we think of as a really full capacity for the apprenticeship program for right now. And um, we're excited about that. So happy to be here and thank you all. I'm uh, Jerry Shartner, but I'll go by Gerald. <laughs> Got another Jerry here. So. so I work for the Department of Corrections. I'm here, I think, to assist with the underserved. And I've been with the Department of Corrections 25 years. And within that role, I had mainly supervised and managed and directed Vermont Correctional Industries. Vermont Correctional Industries has taken a turn. We shut it down and we're moving more toward vocational training, CTE training. And so my, my knowledge of apprenticeships are, are narrow. I know they exist and I know about them, but not a lot. So hope to bring some of this knowledge back to the department and bring the departments to you. Um, my name is Greg Gove. I'm the uh, business manager for Local 693. Uh, Local 693 is the Vermont Union for Plumbers, Pipe Fitters, Welders, and HVAC Techs. Um, as part of that, we run an apprentice program for, it's pushing them about 60 kids now. Um, and we, we do all the training upstairs. Uh, we're running four nights a week classes right now. Before I was the business manager, I actually ran the training department. So. Um, you know, kind of, kind of always been involved in it. Um, before I was with the union, I, I have some state experience too. I was worked for BGS uh, for many years in the Northeast District, so I've seen the corrections end of things as well as you know, um, you know all the all the different state-owned buildings. So, uh, anyways, nice to meet you guys. Uh, good morning, Jeffrey Wilmette, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. I uh, worked with some of you in the past. We represent the inside wireman trade. I'm the other part of the union representing. Um, we have the inside electricians and we have directly involved with the utility apprenticeship as well. So we kind of hold two hats there. I've been in the apprenticeship world for 25, 30 years. I've gone through a couple of them myself. 
I used to be part of the apprenticeship council with Ms. Pam before that disbanded and um, looking to keep the apprenticeship vibrant and moving forward and seeing how we can get it to where it needs to be in Vermont and seeing where we can go with it. I'm Pam Benoit from Benoit Electric. Um, my husband and I started Benoit Electric in 1986. So I've dealt with apprenticeship programs for quite a while. Um, and I have to say, I think the apprenticeship, the, the talent coming in is better than it's ever been for electrical, um, or at least in many, many years. Um, I definitely see a, a difference. And I think that the tech centers really, really do make a difference with that. Uh, and like Jeff said, I was on the apprenticeship council with him prior. So here to help any way I can. I think I know everybody, but just for the record, Jay Ramsey, I'm the Director of Workforce Development here at the department. And what does that mean? I'm responsible for all the things related to the operation of our job centers across the state. There are 11 in the largest communities around the state. Um, we administer Title I and Title III of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunities Act, which is federal money that comes into the state to support the most disadvantaged to get connected to jobs. We support employers trying to find talent. We administer the registered apprenticeship program. Um, there's probably a lot of other things that uh, we do, but for this purpose here, the apprenticeship program rests under workforce development, and we see it as an important part of the workforce development system in the state. It's helping employers meet their needs. It's helping people get good jobs. It's helping fill a space in post-secondary education and training that is shifting and changing. So glad you're all here. Uh, uh, Jerry? Oh, yeah, um, nice to meet everybody. I'm Jerry Bakke. I'm the Network Director of Workforce Development for the UVM Health Network. Been here for just coming up on two years now and truly trying to create work-based learning and apprenticeship in healthcare to meet our talent needs. Uh, my uh, experience in healthcare workforce development goes back almost eight years now. Uh, I've been trying to build work-based learning and apprenticeship in several healthcare institutions um, across the country. And um, actually, I got involved in apprenticeship when I was right out of high school. I'm actually a carpenter journey worker by trade and in the recession, went back to college and somehow found myself in HR and ultimately transitioning into this niche field within HR and workforce development. So nice to meet all of you and really excited to be here. Andrew? Hi, yes, uh, thank you. I'm Andrew Proughton. I'm with the Vermont Agency of Education. I'm the Assistant Director of Ed Quality. So I oversee um, primarily licensing and teacher preparation. Um, so we've been working really closely with, um, with Jay's team around um, trying to create the um, a teacher path pathway through apprenticeships. So um, I've also been on family leave for two and a half months. So this is my first meeting since July. Sorry if I'm a little rusty, but glad to, to meet everyone I haven't met before. Uh, well, welcome. Two and a half months. Yeah. It's all, all my sick leave, so hopefully nothing happens. <laughs> uh, again, I'm Mike Harrington. Uh, I joined the department and state government in 2017 after working for the Department of Bennington uh, for a few years and uh, it started as deputy commissioner and then as commissioner in 2019-2020, uh, first as in room and then uh, as a permanent appointment. So uh, this is actually, I think, into my uh, eighth year here uh, with the state. Um, Hard to believe, but I think a lot of the great work that we've seen uh, and I think what we want to accomplish and I, my hope is that um, we'll talk a little bit more about the duties and responsibilities of the board um, coming up, but um, I would love for this group to be the visionaries uh, of what we want apprenticeships to be uh, in Vermont. And so, um, you know, what can we do? In the immediate to make any improvements, um, but also then, you know, what can we do in the mid and the, in the long term? Um, you know, a lot of the work that uh, 
Jay and Sarah and Cindy and myself and, and Rowan. Uh, Rowan and I just came back from a conference uh, with the National Association of State Workforce Agencies, where I had served as the chair of the board for the past year and a half. Um, you know, there's a we get to see what other states are doing in, our, in apprenticeships um, and bring those good ideas back here. Um, but I think in general, you know, the biggest um, challenge, but also benefit in some ways is the size of our state. Um, it's much more manageable and um, less unwieldy than what I hear across the country from some of these really large states, um, you know, where they're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of apprenticeships. And um, I think we have a, a much more intimate, um, tight relationship with the apprenticeships that come up through our tech centers and, and into our um, into our programs with employers. But I do, you know, we should be constantly thinking about what's our, our five or 10 year vision for apprenticeships. Even if none of us are around the table in 10 years, um, you know, the work that we do now, um, I think could, could chart a course um, for what's to come. So what do we envision apprenticeships being in Vermont? Um, I think we, we also um, have a have started a really great partnership with uh, the country of Austria. Uh, and I've been working with the Austrian embassy here in the US. Uh, Jay and I will be taking a trip at the end of this month uh, to Austria um, with the focus being on apprenticeships, which is really uh, rooted in their culture. Uh, and so uh, it becomes pretty much a given that if you're, if you're coming up through school before you get into the trades or profession, you're doing some kind of an apprenticeship program. Um, and so again, it's really built into their their culture uh, and the structure of their educational system. So, taking best practices from what they do and, and bringing them uh, back here to Vermont. So, are you bringing um, the whole board? Yeah, yeah okay. Okay. that's my. Yes, no, I I absolutely uh, think we can try to make that work. Maybe not this year, but uh, in uh, out years. Um, you know, I think we're we're trying to be the minutes. Yeah, we're trying to be we're trying to be, we're trying to be very mindful of of not only money but of like what are we getting out of this, right? Um, and I think, but I think if if the relationship really pays off, um, that can set the course for how we want to work with um, with Austria going forward um, in other respects too. So that's kind of my uh, two cents. Um, I think first up on the agenda, and we may end up, um, if we end early, and sorry, I'm not looking at the folks online, um, but uh, I'll do my best to, to also jump in front of the camera so you can see me. Um, but uh, we'll try to get through the agenda if we've got some time at the end wrap up early. Um, but I'll pass it off to Jay uh, to give a rundown of workforce development and rental care apprenticeships. I have a slideshow, but I'm gonna talk to you first. And I give you some data points. Um, so you maybe all know this, maybe you don't pay attention to these things, which is fine. <clears throat> but Vermont's unemployment rate is 2.2%. And basically, there's two open jobs for every unemployed person. Our labor participation rate, which is of the available people who could be participating in the workforce, are they? It's at 75%. We're one of the higher states, you could compare that to. I think it's in the 60s. In the 60s? Yeah, so I'll confirm. Okay. It's, but it's pretty high in relation to the other states. And what it means is we don't, there aren't a lot of people on the sidelines waiting to find a job, looking for the perfect thing. There, there are jobs out there we just don't have. We could compare that to a state like Mississippi, where their labor force participation rate is 40, 50%. So they have a lot of people on the sidelines. We don't. Um, another data point that I want to give you is 92% of private sector employers have fewer than 20 employees. So we already know this, but Vermont is made up of small businesses. So 20 or less in my mind is small business. Federal definition of small business is 500 or fewer, so uh, <laughs> we need to get a little bit more specific. So what that means is we have to find creative ways to engage those employers and help them 
train people who might be transitioning from one industry to another or from one occupation to another, or who may be older workers who've had to, because of inflation or changing family situation, may have to re-engage in the workforce. They have to be retrained. They need an introduction to technology, sort of get the, the picture. We're importing talent. So we have um, 680 refugees and immigrants are scheduled or anticipated to resettle in Vermont in the next year. There, um, there are communities around the state, Brattleboro, Bennington, um, Colchester, I'm going to miss them all, Rutland, where refugees are being resettled. And those refugees rely on community partners like the Brattleboro Development Credit Corporation and some other organizations to support them and help them get settled here, get their first job. When they're ready, they're referred to the Department of Labor and our regional offices to get support for training. And we can also help with paid on the job training experience. So um, the system that we administer here is shifting to be more responsive to what the legislature calls workforce expansion, right? We're trying to find people who are not in the workforce that could be in the workforce or people who are not in the workforce as much as they want to be to be there. And so that's all context for the federal programs that we administer, but it has an impact on the apprenticeship program because apprenticeships are jobs, right? So we have to get people into those jobs. We have to help employers build their programs. So. What we've noticed, I think, in the last, well, what I've noticed since I've been here um, is we need to, we're relying more on um, partners to help develop programs. So Sarah might get into some of the details of the partnerships, but I'll just say, for instance, there's a commercial carpenter program in Chittenden County that was the result of some work of Vermont Business Roundtable and the Talent Pipeline program there. So now there are eight competing construction companies sending their apprentices to this program so that they can learn to work in construction. There's, there's some other examples of partnerships. I'll have you address that um, when I get through my presentation, but just we're, we're recognizing we can't go to an employer anymore and say, you know, you wanna have an apprenticeship, here's, here's all the stuff that goes into it. Um, so there's an extra layer of support that we're trying to provide to employers through funding that we're getting through the legislature and from the federal government. As you're pulling that up, I think one of the things that I've heard when I look at those, this is one of those glaring differences between us and larger states, right? It's a significant investment uh, for an employer to make, to create a, an apprenticeship program, and they have to have the the capacity not only in the program but of the uh, the hiring on a regular basis um, to make those apprenticeships uh, worthwhile and so um, some are able to do it and do it well uh, but not everybody um, and if you're only so my probably the most direct experience for me is um, my chair also the the passenger tramway board so the department uh, specs all of the chairlifts in the state you know some of these um, mountains are really only hiring maybe one person or two people every few years. Um, so it's not enough for them to create and sustain an apprenticeship program uh, where they're looking for lift maintenance uh, technicians and mechanics um, to go through levels. Um, so we were able to partner with Ski Vermont uh, and now all of the mountains are sending uh, their, their employees through different levels at in different years of this apprenticeship program. So that was a way for us to leverage a, an intermediary like Ski Vermont, um, help provide some seed funding and um, uh, to help them sustain the program. And then um, they work with the mountains and identify the, the folks. So they have a class, you know, they have multiple classes each year that are graduating 
you know, three, four, five, six individuals out of each level. So I'm gonna um <laughs> Off the ground. <laughs> so what uh what the purpose of my presentation is to uh, it's been a few years since a group met around apprenticeship and uh, as a couple of you have noted you were on the apprenticeship council i was also on the apprenticeship council with you representing the agency of education the council hadn't met during the pandemic and then the law changed and so So I'm going to go over some changes at the federal level. I want to walk you through some of the elements of Act 55 of 2023 and what that means operationally for some things, um, local programs and, and our team here, and then close out my part with some statistics and demographics. <coughs> Why did the law change? The federal or the state? State. Um, so we got there was a federal grant. Good question. Good question. Let's, um, so told <laughs> when so this is this is all tied up in me coming from the agency of education. I came here um, three years ago, two years ago, to be the apprenticeship director, um, and one of the first things that I was sort of gifted was let's we've got a federal grant that is funding work to get us out of our old data system. I won't say any more about that. We're in rapids now. Um, and that was the purpose of the grant to get us to, to sort of modernize our system. So we're modernizing our data system and then we needed to modernize the structure of the statute. Um, so that's really it. The federal government said, yes, we want to fund you and we want you to update your statute. And I'll just say the statute that we did have was, you know, what the green books look like. Um, there, it was just five pages of what our program is. And those, the content of that was probably updated in the 1980s. And so it didn't reflect changes that the federal government made in 2008. It wasn't uh, adequately describing what the department was supposed to be doing. So we updated it. We might have, you know, spent <laughs> it's 55 pages now, so it might be a little too long, but it describes a modern program. And onto this slide here and I think you'll see it as Jay goes through this in the sense that um, it also gives us the ability to make changes to the program um, as and gives us more flexibility. And one of the things we'll talk about is like uh, instructor to student ratios, right? Things of that nature that um, we really didn't have control over, um, but now there's a little more flexibility on how we do that. And with, it, allow, it puts the board uh, in a, in an advisory capacity to help us adjust ratios to make programs viable. Um, so I, again, we'll go through it, but I think a lot of it was helping us bring our, our program current, giving us flexibilities to make it um, sustainable. And I guess I um, I will also say from changes that you might have seen over the years, right? So we we shifted from maybe ten or fifteen years ago where the department was finding the instructors for the programs and we were registering all of the apprentices and we were tracking hours to maybe six years ago where we said we're not collecting tuition anymore we have a partner that will do that that provides the instruction so if, it, if it's sort of reducing <coughs> the administrative burden on the department and allowing us to shift to do more outreach and do more support I think that was one of the things that that got in the way of the department being able to go out and develop and grow the program in different sectors. When I came in, I was shocked at the 
the amount of staff time that was spent just processing information that was coming in from sponsors, entering everybody's hours and um, having to try to troubleshoot why someone's hours weren't in the system. So we, we're not in that role necessarily anymore. So it's when the staff are fully trained, it will allow them to go more outreach work, do more support work to employers. And then also the role of this board is, I think, really oriented to championing apprenticeships, going out and advocating for apprenticeship in communities where we serve people more than it was in the past. So just a little historic, historical context, the um, American Apprenticeship Program was created by the National Apprenticeship Act of 1937, also called the Fitzgerald Act. It gave the US Department of Labor the authority to issue regulations that protect worker safety, rights, so on and so forth. Um, in 2008, so in the 70s, they created some regulations. In 2008, the regulations were updated to add um, requirements for equal employment opportunity and diversity. It changed um, what had been a mostly trades-based apprenticeship system to be more <clears throat> open to other occupations. It also changed the way that um, apprenticeships could be delivered. So they're not just based on time anymore. They could be based on competency or they could be a hybrid. So that those regulations modernize the system. And now in 2023, the federal government well, last year proposed a new set of regulations. This document was 600 and something pages long, um, mostly because they're trying to explain all the changes that they were making. The real regulations were about 100 pages. Jay didn't read the whole document. <laughs> Okay. Test. <laughs> um, but it was open for public comment. We provided uh, six pages of comments to them. Uh, and I think they're probably still reviewing the 10,000 or so comments. So that's just signaling to you all that the rules, uh, the regulations will change probably in 2026 which will then mean that we will have to update our statute and any regulations that the department has enacted. You did try, I think when you were, if I remember correctly, when we were looking at rewriting the law, the law, you were trying to anticipate some of the changes that were coming. So uh, I think we're in a really good spot with the new legislation to align. So this is the written policy, and then another version of policy is what's what kind of funding. So what is the money coming to the states do to improve the conditions for apprenticeship? So in um, <clears throat> prior to 2023, all of the grant funds that came from the U.S. Department of Labor um, Office of Apprenticeship were competitive. So we had to. I had a really compelling grant and get funding. We did a good job of uh, drawing in those funds for Vermont. <clears throat> but last year, they made a shift from it being solely competitive to it being a combination of formula allocations to the states and competitive. So there's still a pot of money. States are eligible to apply for one competitive grant over this five year period that they're doing this. I'll call it an experiment. Um, so that those funds are called state apprenticeship expansion formula funds or safe. So just so you all know, in 2023, we received we submitted an application and received three hundred four thousand nine hundred seventy seven dollars and that. Um, that set of funds is focused on teacher apprenticeship. We funded a position at the Agency of Education who works under Andrew, and that person is uh, aimed at supporting the development of teacher apprenticeship programs. There's a set of them in the Northeast Kingdom that Sarah will talk about, um, but they're also positioned to help 
um, the program be recognized and navigate through the licensing, the teacher licensing program. So sort of apprenticeship for teachers. Yes. That was the 2023 or 2024? 2023. And um, so that money hasn't expired. They extended it for all states. Um, and then this year we received 392,652. And Cindy, you want to? We're, we're, about we're, we're about to. We're about to. We just had to do some combining and rewriting of this uh, of, of the of this funding. Um, do you want to talk about? Let me talk about what it's for. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this um, this focus is the, this year we are focused on the trades and um, building out pathways for uh, and continuing to support the licensed occupations like electricians and plumbers, but also Carpentry, um, we know that we have, um, it's a really important concern for our state that we don't have housing. And so we know that we had, we had so many um, need to repair the housing stock that we have due to some of the uh, flooding that we've had. So we just, you know, this focus is on that. Um, it'll, that 392 will fund some positions, not some positions, parts of positions. Uh, it'll also fund, we're gonna work it, um, providing funding to some intermediary partners that will, will continue to build out those pathways. Uh, we do have <clears throat> some new um, work with uh, our CTE uh, programs that Sarah worked really hard at throughout the summer where we're now um, our electrical and plumbing students who are enrolled in, in secondary CTE programs are able to be taught the actual curriculum that is taught at Vermont State University Randolph. Um, if their centers wanted to do that, and so we have had some good interest there. So basically meaning that we will have secondary students in electrical and plumbing, uh, secondary students coming out and they will enter year two or potentially even three, depending on the nature of their secondary, uh, their CTE program. So um, that's kind of the focus of year two. Uh, we have not applied for any competitive funding yet. We just haven't felt like the um, plan was shaped in a way that we were ready to do that. But this is something that I think we should be talking about and exploring a little bit here. And potentially, this it's always annually. Uh, we put the proposals in every spring, April, I think. So we are beginning to think about what some competitive funding, this one-time opportunity might look like for that's on the horizon. And those, num those numbers are usually a little bit higher, the competitive financial. So what's the difference between the competitive and formula? The, the formula is they just say, they give a list of states and how much money they're going to give. It's based on- Okay. The, so what's a competitive? Yeah. The competitive one, we can, there's a limit to how much we can propose, but we could say we want $2 million to do X, Y, and Z. And if we were the only proposal that came in, they'd probably the, fund the it. formula is um, they have a bucket of money. Yeah. They use the formula to ensure that every state and territory <clears throat> gets their share of that bucket. And then the competitive is, hey, we have this other bucket of money. You all, whoever wants to submit applications and we'll, we'll fund what we will be for them. What is the formula funding go towards now? Um, just these activities that we're um, just talking about and for staff. So these two are both formula. So we still have to kind of put a proposal in as to what we're going to use that formula, even though it's kind of like a given amount, it's still we have to put a plan and a target for each year. So that was why we did the teacher the first for the first chunk and then construction. We could provide the applications or mm -hmm. at least the summary of it. Yeah, the only so just out of curiosity, if teacher is year one and trades carpentry is year two, how do you get continual funding for those programs to succeed? <laughs> <laughs> the question, I mean, this is this is just the struggle with all of the work that we're doing. Once we get company registered and we've funded them with the grant, they sort of 
see them coming back and saying, okay, so we got it stood up now, we need a little bit more money for this or that. And this is real. That's a couple so are you saying you hired somebody to do the teacher grant? The teacher apprenticeship? What are the yeah, what are the money? Um, we have an a, we have a memorandum of understanding with the agency of education. Yeah. We transfer the like half of the money, a little less than half, to the agency to fund a position. And then yeah. we took some other funds that we had and gave a grant to the Vermont Rural Education Collaborative, which is the a sponsor for this pilot project to fund their activities. And then we have some money in that 2023 that pays for a little piece of Cindy's time, some of Sarah's time. I think one of the keys to this is that this is expansion. So the idea is that we're continuing to build out into occupations that we may not have been traditionally having a registered apprenticeships in or um, you know, uh, expanding on those occupations, but the sustainability plan is something that I think this money is not really focused on necessarily. I mean, I think that I keep having to remind myself that an apprenticeship is an employer's training program. And so as and employers <laughs> know this very well, so, you know, we have to figure out how to make that transition from what we can do to demonstrate that it works to then have it be something that can be sustained. Jay, do you know, like as I'm thinking about like the 2024 building trades piece, right? If that's a multi-year apprenticeship program, uh, I mean, should we be thinking about when we put in for our formula funds for it to cover the, like, let's say again, it's a cohort of X number of individuals, but it's a two or four year program. Right. Should we be putting into the grant the the lifespan of that? Right. So we're saying, hey, this is not 392, but it's 1.5 million to cover, you know, four years of a licensure program. Yes, I mean that would be one approach, or we could say we're we're just going to use the money to fund one year programs or Sure, yeah, hours, but something like but that. But we could be thinking about that going forward and seeing whether or not the federal government has an appetite. Can the competitive be multi year? Is that a five year? Competitive is good for five years. I'm not sure. I haven't Maybe. paid attention to those Maybe details because we, we have a one, have the capacity. But I think to... that's what we're starting to think about is if we did want to apply for the competitive, I think we. We all have talked about we don't want it to be just for one thing, right? These formula ones are such a small amount that it goes pretty quickly. But if we were to look at a competitive, we might say, okay, we want to now assist with a part two of the teacher to help mm -hmm. grow that. And we need a little bit more for construction for this next initiative. But then we also need to get into healthcare, right? So we may want to look at, you know, a plan that can kind of go in multiple directions. Now, on the trades one, is that to expand the trades? or to get additional teachers or you know what i mean what what does that do on what's there already um for this for the 392,000 yeah. we are looking at funding intermediary partners mm -hmm. that will um, develop programs um that will there's there's a conversation about a training center to you know um provide a location for ongoing training that good work has started already in this area. So it's really to fund the development of the programs because for instance, you know, prior to, I think two years ago, we didn't have a commercial craft professional occupation registered, or maybe we had at one point and then we just brought it back online. Um, so it's to build out the programs that are necessary, the related training and instruction. I think that that's often one of the challenges is people are, you know, struggle to find where can I get that training component. Right. Um, so that would be a part of it is. Mm -hmm. Some of this should, could also be, um, I think one of the, one of the challenges that we often run into is the, the startup cost is a deterrent, right? Whether it's the equipment or right. the related instruction or it's a field we haven't been in before. So you're also having to build um, interest right. for enrollments. Um, 
and so some of this can also be money that you know whether it's working through uh, a community college or a CTE center or a group of employers, right? The to provide the initial seed money to get the ball, you know, the the rock rolling down the hill type of thing. Where if you have regular enrollment on a regular basis, uh, then that can help sustain the program. But it's usually who who fronts the cost. Yeah. Okay. So. To, to add it on the the teacher front, um, there the state legislature did appropriate appropriate um, a half a million dollars one time funds that my team's managing and, and is going to support these initiatives um, as well as some other just generally teacher licensure. Um, but every one of the partners that we're working with, we're really trying to push them to think about um, how to enter the space of apprenticeships and how to change their programs. So, so one thing that I would love for support from from this group is is how can we support our colleges to be be creative? Um, the states that it is really working in um, for these using the the safe funds into teaching, um, the the community partners and their colleges are really finding ways to lower t tuition, adapting programs to make it so there's just less total credits and time required, um, switching more to that proficiency base or competency base that's that's within apprenticeships, which is really great. Um, and then the other piece on the long term is we're working with a lot of our districts to think of ways in order to better use uh, existing federal dollars. So one is uh, Title II funds are used a lot for teacher professional development. Um, so a lot of our conversations are instead of having kind of each year, here's this new random topic, um, utilize some of those funds to focus your your new hires who are unlicensed and um, go through an apprenticeship program instead of them taking these random professional developments when they don't have that like that basic core understanding that they can get through an apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. Um, so schools are coming around to that. Obviously, school funding right now is a major concern for everyone, but um, we're feeling really confident that the existing federal dollars can be a huge part of this. They just have to think differently about them. So lots of questions about money, and I'm making a note here that we'll follow up uh, to this meeting and and do a presentation more more in depth about the funding that we get. So I'm going to shift from the federal policy stuff to Act 55 and more about the administration of the program. Um, so I have a program if you don't have a team. Um, so anyone that was on the apprenticeship team in 2019 is no longer on the apprenticeship team. They're retired or have been promoted or um, on employment elsewhere. And so, as I noted, when I came over here two or three years ago, um, there was one person on the team and that person retired. And so I trained a new person and then um, some changes happened in the workforce development division. So I became the director and I couldn't focus as much on apprenticeship. Then that's where Cindy comes in and we were trying to keep the wheels on the bus. <laughs> And uh, we were able to um, snag Sarah. So as Sarah noted, she's been here six months and the, we have three positions that are dedicated to apprenticeship. The third person was hired three weeks ago. So we're still on a, a little bit of a learning curve. Um, so that's sort of the context of the administration of the program. We've got a new team. Um, as I noted before, our expansion efforts are shifting to industry partnerships, with the capacity building thing, of like a force multiplier, if you will. Um, as I also noted, we have a new data system called RAPIDS, the Registered Apprenticeship Partner Information Data System. That's a federal government system, and um, we'll, we'll have the Office of Apprenticeship come sometime and do a training for all of you. But just so that you know how the system works, the federal government administers the entire system across the United States. There are some states like Vermont that are considered a state apprenticeship agency state, which means we make our own rules within some parameters. There are other states 
that the Federal Office of Apprenticeship is directly in that state administrator. But for all of the states, a couple of exceptions, we're all using RAPIDS. So when a program gets registered, it happens in RAPIDS. When a apprentice gets registered, it happens in RAPIDS. It allows us the ability to see is someone registered in another state. Also tells us if someone is 15, um, will prevent them from being registered because you have to be 16. And it allows us um, to be able to provide more accurate reports with less labor, less manual intervention. Um, but also interfaces with apprenticeship.gov, which is the federal apprenticeship resource hub. And you can look at data and statistics for all the states. So it, it has a lot of benefits. But what it also means is, whereas in the past, apprentices were sending in their yellow books to us, um, where they're documenting hours, apprentices, and we would enter it into our data system. We don't do that anymore. It's really incumbent on the employers to track their apprentices' hours and keep records and um, maintain that system because, again, it is the employer's own training program. And that's a shift from the way that it was in the past. So that's one of the things that's come with RAPIDS. We don't have a module to enter time. So employers have to keep better records. Do you know, Sarah, um, and if not, maybe this is something you can do over the period of time, but like, I don't know the size of our staff dedicated to apprenticeships. I'm assuming we're one of the smallest staffs in the US. So I don't, and again, I, you know, there's only one state that's smaller than us. Uh, but I, like, if we looked at the bottom, you know, 10 states and or smallest states in the country. I don't even know where, like, I think Wyoming is um, smaller than us. And so uh, from a population standpoint, so I don't know if, um, like if we looked at their apprenticeship program, it would be interesting to see, hey, do they have three like us or do they have like 10, yeah. right? Because I think we have to, a lot of this is around capacity building, you know, if, if Regardless of who's in the White House, the focus through the US Department of Labor has been heavy on apprenticeships and the future of apprenticeships. And that may change over time, but I, you know, I don't think I think our team does great work. I don't think we'll ever reach where we want to be with just three three staff. So I think we're also, as we're thinking about kind of the two, five, ten years down the road, what type of um, Resources do we have to have in play to have a really robust apprenticeship system? Sarah, do you want help? Yes. Okay. No, absolutely. You know, no, no, I do. I do. I do. But, and I think what well, you know, I went to one conference when I first started. Um, so I got to meet some people from other <clears> states and and I don't know about the number of people, but I found it interesting the different titles of people. You know, some states had a quality apprenticeship quality person that just went out and did the monitoring and the making sure programs were running like they were supposed to be. And that's an area we just haven't had the capacity yet. So we're just starting that now with our new person and kind of developing that process. But that means time out on the roads and visiting all these companies and interviewing apprentices and the mentors and making sure. Um, so, you know, some states had a quality, you know, assurance person. Others had a youth based. So just focused on the youth or pre-apprenticeship side. So I think you know, I think growing that way and having people that can really um, focus on one side so we're just not spread so thin right across. <laughs> I think Jay mentioned, and the reason I asked is a few years back, the DOL was doing all the administrative stuff yeah. of it and essentially got pushed out onto the employers, which I get it. Um, our biggest concern with that has been, uh, I mean, we're, we're lucky in that we have a multi-employer apprenticeship program, so we do a lot of our own administration anyways. But RAPIDS was a nightmare. And I think it still is. So getting all of that RAPIDS data in and, 
hey, it's not working today, it's working tomorrow, who do I contact, this, that, and the other thing. So we're still working through that RAPIDS program on the electrical side. And then on the utility side, we, you know, the department had full control over the electrical utility and said, oh, we're done. And so they talked to the IBW and now we're, we've picked that up and we're sharing that responsibility with Green Mountain Power to work with all of the utilities because they have 70 apprentices right now. I mean, that's, it's a lot for the utility industry right now, but it's there's so much um, transition in, in that world right now. So we're still working with all the utilities to get them on board with having them get their standards finalized because none of them, a couple of them have their standards finalized and they're still struggling with rapids. They're still struggling with how to get onto the curriculum, struggling with the work getting instructors. So we're migrating through that, but rapids is a nightmare. <laughs> It'll hopefully get better, but it has been. When that shift happens, does the union absorb that admin or does the employer? It's sort of interesting because with the rapids now and having to report for each apprentice, okay, what are they spending their eight hours doing? Are they doing employing for two, three hours? That's been the disconnect for us because we, yeah. we're not with the apprentice and our employers that we partner with the signatory contractors they their feeling is that okay we're reunion and we we pay you guys to do yeah. this we don't want to have to like do all this other stuff too so it's it's kind of been a hard transition as far as uh getting a handle on re proper reporting but i think you know anything's going to be hard rents new so I only ask the majority still of employers we try to send apprenticeships to, they tell us we don't have the admin capacity to take on apprenticeships. Oh, yeah. 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 We still sponsor them so they can go anywhere. They don't have to. If, if they get laid off with one employer, they we still sponsor them so they can go to another one so they don't get dropped. So to speak. And, and for non union, like we absorb yeah. that cost, you know, the extra yeah. admin. Yeah. And we as an organization have tried to offset that, which is not sustainable either. And for employers that have, um, so I don't want to confuse matters. So just to be clear first, Vermont State University in Randolph provides the related instruction for the majority of electrician and plumber apprentices. The employer's choice to use them or they could use something, someone else, there are a couple of other providers. But in addition to that, um, the State University in Randolph is the sponsor of a multi-employer program, and we give a threshold of four apprentices or fewer. So ETSU kind of administers the program on behalf of the smaller employers. Um, they have been allowing apprentices or people who wanted to be an apprentice to sign up for courses and not have an employer sponsor they're trying to move away from that because that, that's not really an apprenticeship it's just a training so there there may be some opportunity for etsu to help find placements if they want to do this. but there's a timing thing so they sign up for courses in september and they start in october and so if you come in after that, you have to wait so it's not a perfect system. It's improving. It's I think improving. our old system was a nightmare. This one might just be a bad dream. <laughs> <laughs> it's got better. It, it is frustrating <clears throat> and it just doesn't work for no apparent reason. So it happens to us too. Well, you and I used to have those conversations initially with Rapids. Jay, come on. <laughs> you know, the difference, though, the old system, we didn't see that. Yeah. You know, yeah. we didn't see those problems. You guys eventually give us the information we're looking for, you know, yeah. whereas now we see it. Yeah. I, I would be curious, after, you know, after the meetings to hear how frequently it messes up so you can. 
one more quick, quick yeah. question, probably not related, but when we used to register apprentices, they would receive a card in the mail. Um, is that discontinued? Are we still going to do that? Or um, just worried if they get, uh, like, if, say, the fire inspector comes to a job site, not, none of my apprentices actually have physical cards anymore. So, so this is some work that we have to do with the uh, inspectors. Okay. Um, it also, that solution depends on whether Rapids is working. There is a portal where they can go check. Sometimes it works, it doesn't. I don't know why. But Sarah, have you? Yeah, I mean, I know it stopped. The card stopped before I came, but I'm still getting daily questions. Where's my card? It's not coming in the mail. So I, you know, what we've been telling is inspectors have told us they do have a way there to be able to look it up and verify. Okay. The other thing is something we we're still trying to clean up is that every apprentice that gets registered should sign and the employer signs an apprentice agreement document. Mm -hmm. So I say, take a picture of that. A lot of people just have that in their phone and that signed agreement is their kind of proof of registration. Um, do they miss having the card? They do, because they, they used to be able to take it to places like Lenny's and they, they had discounts for, for, oh, for uh, tools and clothes and stuff like that. It was kind of a big perk for them. Yeah, I mean, it, like getting a paycheck. <laughs> from my perspective, it laminated, was like it's a, a little cut out piece of paper that's laminated and it, it doesn't, I don't know, exude professional. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, and I, I think like there's a way for us to do it in a quality way and it's meaningful to. Yeah, that's good. So. That's a, yeah, that's an easy. Yeah. Um, all right, so I'm just going to try to buzz through at the Act 55. Commissioner spoke about the partnership with Austria for us. So Act 55 of 2023 replaced the existing statute and it updated the apprenticeship portion of the statute. It defines the Department of Labor's authority over the system in a way that um, wasn't before. It defines a process for ratio variance requests. So um, we have heard, and even it came up in here, that we need to increase the capacity of companies to train more people, and that is uh, that happens through ratio requests, experiences. Right now, you have a one-to-one, -one, unless you ask for a big. It's really tough for CTE. This is just can't pay more. So, so some part of the. Uh, some part of this is about communicating out to the sponsors the way the statute was written an, a sponsor automatically gets an increase um, after an apprentice completes 2000 hours so if you're supervising one apprentice they get through the first year um, you you might be able to take on two it just depends on the setup and it could grow exponentially but we've also created a process where the employer could say look i need four apprentices to my one master or my one journey worker and there's a proposal for a, a process that's outlined in the statute for them to be able to request that it has to be granted based on safety rating of the employer what's their proposal to make sure that the apprentices are safe. Um, we can go over that in a uh, future meeting. Um, the act requires a strategic plan. We have a draft strategic plan. That's what guided those um, state apprenticeship expansion funds. The federal government required us to have one. So that outlined that work. Um, I would expect to obviously visit that with you all. Um, the act incorporated just new concepts from the federal government. One of those is national guideline standards, um, which is a program that's an organization is registered with the national office to serve as a sponsor in any state where an apprentice wants to learn something and there's not a program in that state. The act defines free apprenticeship and youth apprenticeship in a way that works for Vermont. Those are not concepts that were defined in federal law or any of the regulations. Um, those are also areas where the proposed regulations um, defined it in a way that we didn't find helpful. Um, so 
we have the definitions for those. It defines advanced standing, which is apprentice coming in with previous experience that creates that expectation that an employer would say, yes, you're, we're going to give you advanced standing because you already completed something in another state or with another employer. And uh, this act also focuses on underserved communities and equity. So trying to increase the diversity of the apprenticeship population. I'll show you some stats in a bit. So just quickly going over the top line items from the act. Uh, one section addresses the requirements for program registration and how it operates. Uh, the, the local program, not our program. Another section addresses ratios and the variance process. Another section outlines the standards of apprenticeship, which is that document that contains all of the sort of terms and conditions of an employer's program. Section 118 establishes a minimum enrollment standard and an evaluation requirement. So basically that means if you register a program and after a year you've registered no apprentices, it just automatically gets suspended. And then the evaluation requirements, something Sarah spoke to, the, the federal government is expecting each state to evaluate all their programs, uh, all the registered programs over a period of time every five years. Section 19. Um, establishes requirements for apprentice registration. Next section establishes a, a process for deregistering a program. So we couldn't just come in and say, well, Pam, you aren't doing what you're supposed to do and your program is closed. We have to give you a process so you can say, no, it actually is working really well. And so there's a, there's a process to be heard. Um, this section addresses limitations of the act, which is like, this act doesn't change any federal requirements. This act doesn't. There's a couple of things in there. It's a little section. Uh, the, this section establishes a complaint process for the apprentice if they feel aggrieved by something their mentor did or something about your selection process it comes to us. We maintain complaint processes for every program that we administer. There is a this section creates the criteria for recognizing a pre-apprenticeship program. If um, an organization wanted to have it recognized by us. This section creates the standards for youth apprenticeship programs, which are focused solely on the transition of CTE students into registered apprenticeship programs. And then the final part of the act uh, requires the department to submit an annual report to the General Assembly. Last year we submitted an annual report that was tested in our workforce development report. So in there we provide just basically a report out of all the activities of the system. We highlighted the signing of the agreement with Austria um, and then we provided some of the demographics and statistics that I'm going to show you next. Stop talking for a second and drink some water if you have any questions. Okay. This might be a little specific. Is there advantages to registering your pre program? A moment. <laughs> um, this is a process we have to stand up at. Ideally, the advantage would be that you have employer partners who know what your program does that are waiting to take your participants in turn into two apprentices. All right, so I'm just going to get into some facts and figures quickly. Um, I know I'm over time. Okay, right? Okay, we'll make up time. All right. So I pulled some stats this morning from Rapids. This is the way Rapids displays information. So look at the left hand column first. There are currently 125 registered programs. Now, these programs could have multiple employers underneath them. We'll get into that in a second. So 125 active registered programs. Um, three programs are pending, which means they've come in through 
um, the federal government's website. They refer them to us. And then Sarah and her team does some investigative work to get it to a state where we can register it. Um, there are four incomplete registrations, which means the process has been started and the sponsor has to change or tweak something to get it to approve status. And then there are four suspended. I think those are probably carryovers from when we did we moved out of our old system into the new system. And then there are 32 programs currently that don't have any apprentices. If we drill down on registered, we could see um, that there are actually 445 employers participating in the program. Whether they have their own program or they're participating under a multi-employer program, it's possible an employer could be in two or three different multi-employer programs because of the occupations. 12 employers have been disabled, which means their access to log in to Rapids has been turned off for one reason or another. And then there's there are two incomplete employer registrations. Questions about that? So of the 125 registered, 32 don't have apprentices. Is that yes. how I read that? Yeah. Not that the program, not an employer. So left column is all the programs, and then the right column is sort of the drill down and to get more visibility. We'll go to the next slide, which is about apprentices. The, the next two slides are about apprentices. So as of this morning, <coughs> there were, um, it says 1,809 active apprentices. And if you go down to the overdue line, you see there are 305 apprentices that are overdue, which means when they're registered, the system calculates when they should complete. It's based on the occupation that they're associated with. So this is just a sign that there's some cleanup work that we need to do. So the active count today is probably more like 1,500, 1,809 minus 305. Um, there's two suspended. There's eight, oh, sorry, 46 incomplete registrations, and then seven are pending. So the process is employer creates the registration, Registration comes to Sarah, me, Cindy, whoever gets to it first to review and make sure it's filled out correctly and to approve. Any action that an employer takes in the system has to be approved. Yes. So quality control. Um, so I'm gonna, this is every apprentice in the system and remember, we have programs that take a year to complete. We have programs that take two, three, four, and up to five. Um, so this slide is going to show you the statistics of new registrations this federal fiscal year, which starts October 1st and ends today. So October 1st, 2023 to today. And there's a breakdown of uh, gender and age. So what this tells you is in this fiscal year, 822 apprentices were registered. New apprentices, never registered. The breakdown is 81% of them are male, 12% of them are female, and um, the stars mean that there is a number there, but I suppressed it because it's less than 10. The age breakdown is uh, half of the apprentices are between 16 and 24. 43% are between 25 and 54 and 1% are 55 and older. I'm going to show you a comparison to last year. Last year, 85% of new apprentices were male and 15% were female. 
the average age of an apprentice in Vermont was 27. Average age of a female apprentice is 31. The average age of a male apprentice is 26 and a half. And uh, the majority of the apprentices are white. 4% were black. 4% did not identify. And 1% were Asian or American Indian. These are federal um, categories. And I will note that even though the percentages are small, this is a, a more demographically diverse population than the state of Vermont itself. Uh, do you have the breakdown on those male to female by which apprenticeship program, child care versus the trade? Um, we can get it. Yes. It's a, a process to. I have a guess, but I'm just curious. Yeah. I think they're really, they're in the standard. Um, non-traditional for male occupations, so early child care, um, what was it? Here. 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 The rapids could do anything. I'm assuming that because there's a decline in the percentages for both male and female, that that probably just equates to more people not self identify. Um, we do. So yes, I think the other issue is that um, some employers in the program are just trying to get people registered, so they just click do not self identify, and so there's a full data quality issue there that we need to address. So. I, I, I would wonder if if assuming that most or a lot of them um, are in early childhood, um, that would mesh well with a lot of the, the trends and the data that we've been seeing on, in education workforce. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised there's just fewer and fewer folks going into it um, and, and more people leaving and, and a huge part, ironically, is, is access to child care. Um, so for a lot of working mothers that we've seen over the last few years have have stepped out of the workforce. This goes back to something Jay said earlier, but it's something I think we're keenly aware of. So when we look at Vermont's labor force participation rate, we are pretty good compared to other states and across the country. It's actually 65.7%. Okay. Um, but the but the the highest we've ever been, I think, was back in the 80s and we were like 70. Right, so 65.7 is still pretty high for us, and it's actually high for the, the nation. Um, the, the, the things to know about the labor force participation rate and how to utilize that number for something meaningful is that you can age into the labor force, right? So there's a under the age of I think 16, um, you're not counted in the labor force. And then afterwards, you are counted when you enter the labor force and begin working. You can't age out of the labor force. So no matter how old you get and whether you retire, you're still counted as part of the labor force. Um, the only people who aren't counted in the labor force are minors and people who are institutionalized, um, you know, whether it's incarceration or some other. Um, and so really, the, the Vermont saving grace on the labor force participation rate is that people work uh, longer in their lifetimes in Vermont than in other states because we have such an old workforce. Um, so there are a significant number of people working over the age of 55. Um, but we really should be, it, for our purposes, I think, looking at the labor force participation rate, which can be broken down by age category um, for the prime working age. In Vermont. And that's where um, you know, when other states are thinking about, it, other states look at it, so I, I have a friend who works um, and ran the Alabama Department of Labor, you know, they have a real hard time getting people in the prime working age to get into the labor force. Uh, and so that's where they focus a lot of their energy. When you look at Vermont and our labor force participation rate in the prime working age, it's actually very high. Um, so again, just as we're looking at this, right, and looking at the age categories, um, they those pretty much align. I have one more slide, and then um, an Excel sheet to show you. 
So the other components of the program is occupations. So these four occupations were newly registered, which means there's a there's a sponsor associated with them. Metal building assembler, one company has one apprentice. Um, environmental control system installer, HVAC technician, pre-K to eight teacher, and a timber frame company. So I'm gonna I'll stop sharing. I have one more new one just this past week that they're calling a solar PV installer. So it's a big thing. Um, solar projects are big now, but because um, it's the requirements and the licensing is so different from state to state, there cannot be a, a federal program. So we base it off the construction because it's pre hooking up to the grid. So that's the key. So it's construction, but there is some electrical component. So that's where it gets uh, a little interesting. So, so they just built the program. They don't have any apprentices yet, but. Who built the program? Uh, the company is named Solar Operation Solutions out of Morrisville. Is the HVAC one uh, like automation, uh, like just system controls or like the whole nine yards? I think, no. Is that the one with the HV in New England Air? I could, I could get you information. So um, this one also. This is the list of uh, act, list of occupations with active apprentices. A little room for error here in some of these that have one. You can see the range of occupations from accounting technician to uh, metal building assembler, child care development specialist, um, CNC operator programmer, uh, correction officer, Electrician, maintenance electrician, line maintainer, machinist, manufacturing production technician. What are these filters do? These are the number of apprentices that are reported as active in this occupation. The last two, waste treatment operator and water systems operation specialist. They, this, uh, Rural Water Association works with municipalities to train their water technicians. So the, I, we didn't delve into like what's the universe of the occupation. So this is just to show we've got manufacturing and trades and healthcare and childcare. So just information for you. State trooper. Correctional officer. So we have several programs that are registered to parts of state government. Jay, I'm just monitoring time. This is this is all I have. Okay. <laughs> this information you're going to share with us via mail or yep. Just, I think part of too what we should talk about is uh, what information is. Good for this group to have on a regular basis when we meet, you know, when we get into our cadence of meeting regularly, what type of data should we be bringing uh, as a department for you to review? Uh, uh, the, the board's required to meet quarterly, uh, but we can meet more frequently if desired. Um, and uh, the other piece, too, and I think we do some of the, I know we do this with other programs. I just, um, I don't know to what extent in apprenticeship, but we could also be. Um, partnering with uh, unemployment insurance uh, to track wages over time, uh, like longitudinal studies. So uh, we could be looking at uh, apprentices that complete this program, you know, what were their wages at the end when they entered the program or when they completed the program and what were their wages, you know, in employment like six months out, 12 months out, uh, two years out, uh, and look at what that does uh, in our system. It could be kind of a skewed number because it sometimes as an apprenticeship, you're not always paid 
And some people are leaving higher wages to go into a program, sure. potentially getting lower wages until they graduate. Yeah. With yeah, so you could be looking just at when they're an apprentice and beyond. Yeah. Right. So what was their employment like? That will start. Two years. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Right. And you can see whether or not they changed employers multiple times. You can see, you know, a lot of that data is tracked um, nationally to, again, just highlight the significance of apprenticeships in terms of uh, wage growth. Uh, I'll just do quickly a rundown of the duties, um, which are outlined in the, in the bill. Um, but essentially, it's written as the Vermont Apprenticeship Advisory Board is established to advise the department, the sponsors, employers, related instruction providers, and to promote the development and strengthening of apprenticeship programs. Um, the board shall receive and review reports from the department regarding provisional and registered apprenticeship programs, including programs under development and program registration proceedings. Uh, the board shall advise the department on the creation of new apprenticeable occupations. Uh, the board shall advise the commissioner on requests for ratio variances, which we already talked about. The board shall advise the department on policies and procedures developed by the department and on the adoption of rules. Um, the board shall provide technical guidance for identifying and promoting best practices in operating apprenticeship programs. Uh, the board shall create and convene working groups that are tasked with specific uh, activities related to improving the quality, safety, diversity, and alignment of apprenticeship programs. Working group membership is not limited to appointed member of the board. Um, and the board shall uh, meet at least quarterly or more frequently as requested by the chair to accomplish the objectives. Um, I, I think the other piece too, Jay, that I was thinking about, it's not in, the, in this, but um, there should be some alignment or integration uh, between this board and the state uh, workforce board. Um, and that board is going through a reconstitution as well uh, and a reappointment of members uh, with a slimming down of the board in recent statute from 51 to 27. Um, and so uh, once that board is appointed, there's also an office of uh, workforce expansion and strategy or workforce development and strategy that um, will admit, essentially administer and advise the board um, and their staff there. It's staff that's already existed in the past, but they need to be appointed. And so uh, that's all work that should be coming out in the next uh, month or so. This, these two groups would have a, a close tie-in. Uh, there's a vacancy on this board. Someone from the state yeah. workforce board would be. Uh, anything else you wanted me to cover under that? Or shall we jump into Sarah's? Any mm -hmm. questions on the duties, responsibilities? Great. Well, mine's a pretty quick and easy one. <laughs> So we do want to um, think about future meetings. So we are uh, supposed to meet at least quarterly. So I think I just wanted, you know, brief conversation about um, better days of the week. You know, do we want to consider them all in person, obviously with the option to be remote, um, or maybe every other one is <clears throat> remote for all of us, or you know, kind of what's the best thing for you? Um, we're kind of we're at the last day of the third quarter, right? So do we want to meet fourth quarter, um, which will put us kind of the end of December though, which is a hard time. So maybe we want to look at the beginning of January and start. So just any thoughts, any, it was Monday, a good day for people. <laughs> Kentucky yeah. day, but Monday work because uh, that's usually our okay. put fire out days. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Expected to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> the fact that we could all get together on this Monday yeah. seemed unusual. Technically, I think we should probably meet this year because uh, we're kind of yeah. in the second quarter. We haven't made it to the fourth quarter yet. Um, so we should try to meet some point in maybe November. We can hear about your trip to Austria. Yeah. Or Pam and I's trip to Austria. <laughs> yeah, right. And exactly. another another kind of important thing that's coming up to share is that we are going to undergo our first or, or of recent years um, full program review on November 4th and 5th. This date. Uh, 
six. Fifth I think. and six. So yeah, that means in. basically the yes. federal team will come and um, take a look at all of the things we've been doing and compare our practices and look at our rapids data. Um, and so we, if we were to schedule a second meeting after that, it would be we would have some information to share. Five six November. Okay. We want to look at third week of November before the holidays. Stay away. Ah, and Rowan is noting that that may be National Apprenticeship Week, which oh, would be the perfect time to meet. Well, but that's a great <laughs> Yeah, I think so you're talking so we could also do the week of the 10th right the 11th is but veterans day but if we're looking at the 12th 13th 14th Fourteenth would be magic for me and but a I lot love of times it. that would work I agree as long as it's like midday ish, like this one was to be. Yeah, midday is a great feel thing. better day. Yeah. I uh, left my work phone at home, so I can't. <laughs> any, uh, Do you want me to check the hour of meditation? He's got your password anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we actually share a password. So. <laughs> okay, so we're looking at that works for me too. Thursday, November 14th. We like the 10 to 12 time frame. I also think it it's uh, I'm fine if we want to keep the hybrid option. Uh, I think we would just want to know ahead of time who's going to participate in person, um, and we'll do our best to you know provide some some drink and snack of some kind. Um, but you know we're not that way. We're not fine for ten when two people show up. Uh, otherwise, I think the hybrid option. So, and then I do think it might be good because we all have busy schedules to think about like what would be our normal quarterly. We want to look at the second Thursday of the quarter on an ongoing basis, just so we could be, even be looking out into 2025. I think, yeah, if we can in the next meeting set the schedule for 2025, okay. right? That would be yep. a great piece of, you know, we can say these are our four schedules. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me, but even some objectives so like you guys might be looking at us to yeah. do help determine whether it's quarterly or monthly or yeah. I think the other piece too, not to give a lot of homework to the group, but um but I think Sarah, Jay, Cindy, you know, if you're how do we keep this group rest of things that are happening both in the department, but also uh, at the national, right? So as you know, we're promoting National Apprenticeship Week, it would be to make sure the board uh, is involved uh, in those opportunities as well, or you know, at least made aware of um, the things we'll be highlighting that week. Um, what is it, May is uh, Youth Apprenticeship Week too, so we've got two of those coming up. Uh, figure out how to involve the board. But I also think, you know, to me, when we think about getting together next time, what are the pieces of that meeting we want to have, right? So some of it can be information sharing. Will there need to be any decision making? What what is the level of the, the board needing to do during you know your what are the objectives? Um, are we wanting to help try to articulate um, at least the, the first part of a of a longer term vision that we're trying to create or where do we um, see as gaps or hurdles in the system, right? If the ultimate goal is to increase um, the, the adoption or creation of new programs and increase the number of apprentices. Um, I think we, we know across the state there are, and I think all of you probably do from your own respective areas, know where we're missing the mark 
as a state or as uh, the workforce development division or as an apprenticeship program, right? So where can we be um, capturing more students that are in some transition point in their life? Um, how do we make sure those folks graduating high school are staying in Vermont and not leaving the state? Um, how do we make sure, um, you know, people are in the state because of lack of employment opportunities? All of those, those things. If we want to try to um, highlight or target uh, underserved or underrepresented populations, you know, how, do, how are we improving our work there as well? So those are all types of things that I think this board can help us uh, prioritize, strategize. <laughs> It'd be good to know there's a lot of initiatives, it feels like happening across the state and hard to know who's involved in what and where, like the weatherization training center that, you know, just was funded um, by an out of state company, but a big focus of that was an apprenticeship model and an instructor pathway as well, but that seems like work outside of here, I guess. One of the slides that I put in and then took out was work with higher ability. So like a slide about all the um, special populations, if you will, that we're working with partners on higher ability, Vermont adult learning. Um, there's probably a couple of others, but that, that wasn't right. visible here. So I, I agree. We could say here are all the initiatives. Yeah. That would. The other thing we should do is just throw it out there is wordsmith. Apprentice and pre apprentice. Because yeah. you have employers and unions who think of it one way, and then you've got educators think of it a different way. Even though you, you said Act 55 defines it, I think we ought to have that discussion so that way we all same page when we're talking about either one. I, I think the other piece too that we run into a lot is the term apprentice is used interchangeably by a lot of people. And so we also are trying to figure out how do we highlight the value of registered apprenticeship program and that's what you know the, at the national level they're trying to figure out too uh, is how to highlight the the value behind being in a registered apprenticeship program as opposed to what somebody might call just an apprentice because they're they're doing on the job training and there are changes coming to the WIOA program federally that really help this yeah okay. <laughs> We got one other thing too, as far as I think we could boost those numbers big time. Um, you were talking about adding extra staff and whatever, but I think the inspectors that are tasked with going job sites and doing the permits and everything, they, they're so overworked that they don't have time to focus on any enforcement. And we hire a lot of kids that are, hey, you know, I work for this guy and he said he'd make me an apprentice in a year and it's been two years and nothing happens. I think there's a lot of those workers that are out there that are should be apprentices that aren't that we need to like if we had one person that could just go job site to job site and make sure everyone's playing by the the right rules that would be that would boost those numbers right yeah, off the bat so right yeah. sarah is um as she's gotten her feet under her one of her goals is to be at um, both the electrical licensing board meetings and the plumbing just to have our presence there which has not been as consistent as it should be but i think that would be a good um, that might help close the loop on some of those. Yeah, that's my first one's tomorrow. And that's um, that's a big topic, especially now. Again, we've moved away from those yellow books and the cards. Yeah. Um, but how people are tracking hours and that for electrical, there's one test, there's one set of hours that's supposed to show categories for, but it doesn't fit every employer. We have a lot of industrial electricians that are working on machines. They're not building houses. But yet they have to make up, and they're telling me they're making up numbers to to right fit the requirement. They, they and it's so it's you know are we encouraging them to submit to the licensing board incorrect hours, and how can we work with the board to make this a, a better system and uh, and try and help the employers as you mentioned the administrative side of tracking those hours? Uh, is it the apprentice's role? Is it the employer's role? You know we get apprentices fourth year thinking they're graduating, and they say where's my certificate and I have no hours for you. Yeah. <laughs> and if my employer didn't do that, and I've had three employers over the last four years. So how am I going to go back to three different? That's very, so very common. tough. It's That's really a tough common. thing. So I think just some system, you know, like as we issues. continue to think about modernizing, one of the things we've also spent yeah. some time looking at is some sort of technology 
that I mean, we all have these at the end of our arm, you know, that we could use for tracking. And we've even seen some demonstrations from some vendors out there that might, and we might be able to do some pilots with some target, targeted groups of either electrical or plumbing where there's a big volume and is there an easier way to do it? Like, let's see, let's maybe take away some of the manual pieces that we have. We've certainly come a long way with that, but there's probably even more we could do. And that would be something we would want, I think, this group's advice on, and, you know, for us to share it with you and say, do you think this would even work? Because it looks like a great tool, but we want to make sure people would use it if we were going to. The utility industry, there's they have the pretty much the same standards, but their OJT hours are different. Each utility does different work. Burlington Electric does a lot of underground. All the others do above ground. Some do street lights, some don't do street lights. So we've tailored theirs to mirror what they actually do. They all get their certification at the end of the day. They all become line workers somewhere. It's not until they go to work for another utility that they learn a different aspect of what they do, no different than me going to work for Pam and never did that before. All right, now I'm gonna learn it. But I still got a license. Because hours on the job training, you know, if you work for a residential company, that's totally different right. than a commercial, you know, so it can be totally different. Yeah, it's not a one size fits all. But it's really, still a license. It's yes. But is it the same licensing test that they all take? No matter yes. what your work. So, you know. Well, even the test is just the code. Right. You got to know the code. But even in the electrical world, you don't even need to go through an apprenticeship to get a license. You need 12,000 12, documented hours. You don't have to go through an apprenticeship to get a license? Well, if you don't, you have to have 12,000 hours. But if you do, it's 8,000 hours. How do you get the 12,000 just working? Since but um, tracking hours, that is a problem. If we get a new employee, they say, oh, yeah, I was registered. And there's nothing. There's, you know, that's tough. Because they don't, these kids, they don't know that they're not really yeah. getting somebody it's, tracking this for them and updating. And, yeah, some of that is some our feelings when they leave, they, oh, they withhold the information. Oh, yeah. So if there's something electronic where they're doing it right along, yes. then they can't. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, so. That's what the two apps that we looked at that other states are using. You know, that's one of the things we've heard is that it puts it into the apprentice's hands. So yeah. every day they ha they can see where hours they are and they hit send and it goes to their the master and they have to approve and it goes to us. And we so the it apprentice? It. Does it? Yes, they oh, have to gosh. initiate. Well, that's why we need the question, right? But the, the instructor, the license has to, has to sign off. off. Yeah. So at least they're not doing the manual. Yeah. It, it's just getting an apprentice to do that. Yeah. Well, I mean, my, my kid does it yeah. learning how to drive her. You know, she's got well, her permit yeah. and she has to oh, track yeah. all her hours in order to qualify. Well, there's so. an incentive behind the yeah. here, but still, that's a I, lot to train on, too. And I started, um, well, it's been a few years now, um, to a point, you don't get your raise till you update your hours. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, it has to be, there has to be an incentive. They have to learn from day one. It's just something that's expected. And, you know, our counterparts in Maine said, you know, eventually it's a learning curve, but they do like it eventually because they always know exactly where they are. They oh, see yeah. their progress. Nice. If they don't do it, they get a ping, right? Yeah. Hey, you didn't enter your hours this week. You got to do so that. That's and good. You it's get just, yeah, the, the first ones, the first year apprentices coming in, that, that's, that's just what that's they what know. You know. Yeah. Yeah. What, what's the, the hit? Cost associated with the app. Oh, yeah, we haven't well, told them that yet. There, there's no <laughs> cost. Well, I'm very curious, and that, like to me, it's it seems like this is where we should be heading. I right? think so. so I, think I don't have a specific number. I mean, I know what the number is. Is it 15 million dollars? <laughs> no, it's not. It's 41 million. Either. It's in the gray. <laughs> is it in, in the gray? No, not yet. I mean, it's less than 100,000, okay. but it's it's an implementation cost. Of, Getting yes. everybody set up. Yeah. Sure. How to use this. Oh, yeah. But we can, do, we can also do a pilot program. I mean, we could even start the, the RFP process too, if we wanted to do an RFP process um, and 
just start looking at, or even an RFI, and just get the the information. Um, but I think that would be seems like this is not easy, but I'll call it low hanging fruit in the sense that it's uh, it would have a big impact, yeah. and it's something that could be implemented over a relatively short period. The other thing that we're noticing with our in our partnership with Vermont State University around the the related training and instruction is they're catching if, if plumbers or electricians are signing up for a, 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 a course there's a that's a point where there's a touch like there's a touch point and it's like well wait we don't know anything about you as an apprentice mm -hmm. and so that's when we because of the relationship that we've more put more structure around Sarah's team gets a call and says from Vermont State University you know X company is registered wants to register for our class. We don't have anything about them, so it gets us then in touch with the employer. So I think we've been catching a little, a few more of those. That so hopefully we will start to reduce the people who are working without being registered, and also the people who are moving and losing track of you know right what they have earned for hours. Because this is rapid. If I work for a company and they recorded my hours, and then I go to another company. Is that supposed to show automatically or? Yes, if they had, if the previous company had entered it, um, it's uploaded onto a documents tab. And then usually the company would send in a, a change of status form saying, okay, they left our company on this date with this many hours. So when we get that and then we get a new registration, we could, we just transfer that right over. So that's how it should work. It very rarely, usually I go to transfer and there's nothing in there. Right, because when somebody <laughs> leaves, how often do you get somebody say it's they've left, they've gone somewhere else? Um, right. right. And that's where this monitoring and this mm -hmm. ongoing, you know, cleanup and, and this new system are, yeah, when they're signing up for level four classes before they can start level four, we need to see some hours in there and we just need to. Yeah. You know, it's a lot of going back now to clean up. I think once we get there, we'll have a mm -hmm. good process going forward. Right. But it's so much uh, just back Absolutely. work to, um, and, a, and a lot of education, right? I think we need to really get the employers on board when they sign on to be an employer sponsor. What does that mean? What are your responsibilities? And right. how can we support you in that? Because it shouldn't, you know, we hear a lot, oh my gosh, rabbits is so hard. It really shouldn't be, and it doesn't have to be, but I think we need to, like the apprentices start them early and like this is what you do for each one and you know and, and the rapids it's nothing we had to do before yeah, so it was like oh <laughs> well and even yeah. if you could it registering free apprenticeship programs i was just saying to sarah one thing that not all apprenticeships go through a free apprenticeship program beforehand but doing a module training on that beforehand so before they even get to an employer that a free apprentice at least knows the process. modules that are part of a registered Yes. Yeah, program. exactly. Yeah. Which is smooth transition. Because yeah. if it's part of a registered, that's where the terminology comes in. Yes. If it's in a, a module in a registered, then it is not pre apprentice. It's an apprentice program. You're going to finish this module, yeah. give you 30 hours. We will then submit it through the system. DOL accepts it for the employer. Jay, when's the uh, next round for the safe? Spring. So they usually announce in is it March February. and they give you all a month to put your plan together. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why we need to be thinking about it now. So the current SAFE grant, even though we applied and received it in the last the program year that ends tomorrow. It started in July. It started in July. Yeah. So but basically it's they are treating it like it's a bank account and every year you apply and get funds they just put them in the same bank account so we don't have like they're not new grant numbers it's yeah. one grant number and the balance gets refreshed every so i think but this group should be could be helping to identify types of things we might want to <clears throat> and that's some states have used part of that money for those apps that's yeah. where some of that funding has come from well i think it'd be you know in my mind we should be looking at what other states have done, but they, it's always the implementation cost, the setup, the implementation that costs the most. And so I think if we build that into that, if we, you know, if you're we're able to put staff on one of those grants, even adding another person for a two year period, right, helps us move the program forward.
Oh, one other thing on your list. We, oh, yes. We're waiting for a little information on it. Yes. So there is supposed to be a process for mileage reimbursement for all of you coming here today. I just don't know at this yet, so I may have to well, be following up with you. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure it's year end close out and all sorts of um, counting things for the business office. So there's a form that we'll send okay. to you that you fill out. And we, um, we may need to set some of you up as a vendor, so you have to fill out a second form. To yes. Put it towards my trip to Austria. <laughs> <laughs> Just write. You'll be you'll be all, the all squared up and ready to go in 2030. <laughs> um, it, the last section we have, which we're right on time, is any comments? I'm not sure if there is any. Is uh, anyone online? So, uh, so, who does this go out to? You say public comment. How is it? Announced? So the the meetings are noticed um, through. The, standard notice procedure, which is posted on the Secretary of State's website, on our website. I think as we become more active, you may, you know, for instance, um, again, when we do the tramway board, a lot of the mountains participate in those because the decisions that board is making directly impacts them. We could be having, you know, as we build out our agenda, we might have uh, members from the CTE community or other employers that want to come in and speak to the board. Uh, if we want to be talking about like future rulemaking, uh, we might have public comment then. So I, you know, the, the public comment section is just a placeholder because I don't think many people are going to come to the first meeting. But um, it really depends on either whether we have outside speakers coming in or we're handling a topic that would garner some interest. Great. Um, I'll just. Pause there for a second and see if anybody has any questions, comments, thoughts, concerns. Ah, oh, we can adjourn. Made Vermont. Nice. Comment? No. <laughs> 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 Andrew, anything First from your Support the <laughs> printer apprenticeship program. Great. All right. Uh, Thank can you. I have a motion to adjourn. All right. And a second. All right, perfect. Uh, I'll, anybody opposed? How about we just <laughs> Okay, uh, motion passes. We are adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Thank Appreciate you. your first Thanks for your participation yeah. in our first meeting. Yep. Nice to meet everyone. Yeah,